coming in tonight. Um, give you a, a quick introduction as to what the, the tools and techniques that we're using that seem to be working for uh, the markets. Um, a couple things that we'll get through. First and foremost, if, um, if you do not have a full screen at the uh, toolbar of the, there's a little icon, looks like a little, I guess, broken window or window. If you hover your mouse over those icons, that'll tell you what to do. Full screen, small view, uh, et cetera, et cetera, fit to screen. So you can expand that by clicking, uh, as John Paul says, uh, you can expand your screen up there. Okay? So um, it, this is being recorded. I did click the record button, so we got that's all good. Um, in addition, I want to make sure we already did a sound check for the majority of folks. So we had a A-OK -okay on the sound, so we'll get right into it. Um, before we do, remember um, trading is risky. Past performance is not indicative of future results. And this is educational uh, material in nature. And if you want to take a minute to read over this disclosure, it'd be great. And then speed read. There it is. Okay. So a little bit of history. Some of you are familiar with my work and some of you are not. So I'll just do a little quick house cleaning here. Um, this book, Mastering the Stock Market, came out, um, and, and a lot of the uh, material that we'll talk about tonight is actually in that book. That book came out, I can't believe it's been almost five years now that book came out. I can't believe it, where the time flies. Um, some of you may also be familiar with my work as a co-author and editor of the Commodity Traders Almanac, which is no longer in print. Um, this went on for about eight years. Um, you know, I think after the financial crisis and people weren't really trading commodities, but what they missed was that my work, um, as I've been doing for decades, has to do with a lot of correlation. And um, since the advent of high correlated ETFs to commodities and the transition that we've seen now, inverse ETFs, leverage inverse ETFs, you know, we find that more people are trading commodities. But that was my concept. That was my idea. And what, what I was looking at was stocks and ETFs that were highly correlated to the seasonality of commodities. And that, that was a very popular book. Uh, and, and to this day, a, a lot of professional traders uh, reference the work that we did with uh, that publication. Um, some of you, if you have a Thinkorswim account, are probably familiar with the person's pivot indicator or the PPS buy and sell indicator. As well, if you have TradeStation, you probably have and had access to my HCD and LCD scans. We're going to get into what those acronyms mean um, and how are they working in today's environment and how could you learn more about it. Uh, we uh, put together and we're the creator of a Trading Triggers. It's an educational trading program and I am a member of APTA, the American Association of Professional Technical uh, Analyst Society. So um, I've been around for 35 years. Um, my first beginning came in at uh, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange when I was 16 years old. And I um, had no intentions on being a trader, but I, I was a runner. And um, as I was going to school, uh, I ran into a guy while I was studying on a train. His name was George Lane. Uh, George is credited for popularizing the indicator many of you probably use to this day called stochastics. And I worked for George for two years. Um, and I decided that George, uh, being a young kid, wasn't paying me enough and went off to trade and figured out I was really uh, interested in trading the financials, the treasury bonds, and uh, discovered how to apply when they first introduced options. The very first commodity was on treasury bonds. So back in the early 80s, I, I learned how to leverage leverage with leveraged vehicle product like futures to uh, the options on futures which uh, as a directional trader uh, with the skills that I had acquired, um, it, it was something that really helped launch uh, a lot of, um, uh, well, I'd say uh, 35 years in this business. So with that said, many of you uh, might be familiar with candlestick analysis and also pivot points. This book right there, it's coming out with its second edition, launched over a decade ago. A lot of people reference that, a lot of professional traders and uh, what's really neat about this um, is that the mechanics and the basis of what's in this book right here, this candlestick and pivot point training triggers, we've actually developed into trading systems and signals. And um, what we do is we've helped individuals and professionals, and I'm talking registered investment advisors, 
uh, wealth managers, uh, banks, institutions, um, how to come up with better trades. And some of those trades we're going to discuss tonight and how you can uh, utilize this information on your own. So that's what uh, we've been doing. We've been kind of busy. And um, I would have to say we have several applications in the TradeStation trading platform. We also have add-on packages with Trade Navigator. Some of you might be familiar with Genesis software. And then we do have two very powerful um, indicators that are licensed on Thinkorswim. I've already named them. One's the PPS indicator, and the other, of course, is Person's Pivots. We have private mentoring. We do semi-annual seminars, um, twice a year, that is. Online trading courses. We have a live trading room, and we have a, a very um, incredible weekly thoughts and observations that are based on everything so far that, that I've um, told you where we get it from, the books. So with that said, a little house cleaning here. Um, events that we do, we started our own cruise say, five years ago. And this uh, summer, like as in Thursday, I get on a plane to fly to, uh, we're going to Barcelona. We're going to be cruising around with a, a bunch of um, traders. Yeah. And we're going to Spain, France, and Italy, and we'll be gone for a week and a intensive, uh, of course, mixing fun, business, and pleasure on that cruise. Um, was sold out. It's uh, fabulous. So we're going to have a great time as well as some great learning and review what we've done so far this year. And then the next event that I'm putting together is in September, right down here in Palm Beach, Florida, on September 24th through the 26th. And those are always incredible events that we've put together. So let's get started. How do I make money? What do I do? What are my indicators? And I call it the 12-step program um, because there is no one holy grail of indicators. Um, and I'll go through a few of them tonight with you because, I, quite frankly, you can't go through everything in, in just uh, a 45-minute to an hour presentation. But uh, the PPS indicators on uh, Thinkorswim, and elsewhere, there are actual buy and sell signals. And uh, we use those. They're easy to scan. Um, how do I scan and what sectors do I scan in? Well, we absolutely use seasonal and cyclical analysis. I use chart patterns and, of course, person's pivots, which we'll get into tonight as well. But the candle pattern that I wanted to discuss as well is called the high and low close doji. This is something that I um, published um, and uh, trademarked back in 2003, I think it was actually, uh, candlesticks and combining candlesticks with pivot point analysis, uh, I was the first really to introduce combining the two uh, concepts. Today, um, a lot of people follow up with that work and has, uh, like I said, if you're using pivots, you probably have learned them from someone that had um, at least studied or had been repopularized uh, by yours truly. Uh, in addition to that, something that I uh, started to teach years ago was volume analysis, but many of you are probably now familiar as it's become more and more popularized is the on-balance volume indicator. Um, and I uh, did a study uh, a decade ago, actually, well, let's see, 26, now eight years ago. I did a study and explained to people at these conferences and trade shows that um, a lot of people were struggling with volume histogram and very simply put, I think um, volume histogram started the, started to not work as efficiently. I think because there was a landscape of changes in our in our the the markets that we trade, the way we trade them, and rules and regulations such as institutions that use and implement dark pools. Number one, and number two, options and inverse or even ETFs that have taken away from the volume of underlying markets. So. With that said, if, if more folks are trading options and institutions are trading options, someone could buy, a, you know, a, a 500, uh, or actually we just saw this the, a, a week and a half ago, someone sold 10000 out of the money, spy puts, uh, and used that to help finance buying some spider calls. Um, so looking at a synthetic long position in the options, that volume is not going to show up in the underlying ETF or would it show up in the futures? So if you trade, if you trade options or if you trade equities, 
these are two main changes that have taken place in our industry. And I've done some extensive work there. And um, I think it's, it's kind of important that we combine both volume histogram as well as on balance volume. And I'll share a little bit of that tonight with you. Um, I have a couple proprietary exclusive indicators that I've created. I also use relative strength, and I'm going to get into that tonight right there, what relative strength is, pairs or spread trading, because there's a couple things that um, really made sense that we looked at over the last few weeks. And many of you, if you just understand this market and the equity market, some of you may agree, has been a very technically orientated market. It's been a very sector rotated uh, market segment like literally on steroids. In other words, we have seen money flow into utilities, out of biotech, back into biotech, into semis, out of semis. Now it's energy, XOP. And we have seen this gyration move along this entire year. And every time the market takes a big dip, we always seem to hear big banks, not little banks, but big bank analysts telling everyone, sell your stocks. And then the media promotes that. And you know, instills more fear in the general public. It's kind of funny because um, how many people, and I will take a poll on this, how many people, how many of you guys um, heard about the fabled head and shoulders top in the market just a week and a half or two weeks ago? I mean, everybody was talking about, oh, the market's going to go down. It's a head and shoulders top. And the funny thing is, is I sent a tweet out um, in announcing to people it's not a head and shoulders top until it breaks the neckline. In fact, I did a little funny thing. I, I, I got to share this with you guys. Um, on my website, let's see if we can find the website here. On the website, uh, I have uh, a Twitter account. And we, we've tweeted out a lot of really amazing things before they happen. Um, but here is one that I tweeted out. I thought it was kind of cute. Um, as you can see, we've um, this is uh, back on May 20th. Here's what a head and shoulders top looks like that hasn't broke out. Never anticipate the signal you'll get soaked. Um, we've got a bunch of LCC breakouts, and you can go through some of these. Uh, actually, there's my little uh, Oracle trader right there. That's me, and this is my office. Um, but what we put out is a lot of times you'll see these little nomenclatures. Um, Back on May 16th, we were talking about SMH, the semis, biotech, and the technology triggered a daily buy signal, and Facebook flashed daily sell signal. Um, interesting to note that Facebook went down, and as you know from back then to now, these three sectors have carried the market up. But um, we actually have tweeted out some really nice stuff before they happen based on what I'm sharing with you tonight. So uh, besides that, I think it's important that besides spread analysis. Um, there's a different, you'll notice that there are 12 kind of bullet points. Money management and position sizing guidelines, that, you know what, that, that's relevant whether you're trading futures, options, or stocks. But here are the indicators, and I don't want you to think it's information overload. There is a trading tool. One is for buy and sell signals. These two right there for buy and sell signals to run scans. Person's pivot tells me if the market's at a support or resistance. Um, a lot of your chart patterns are, for the most part, consolidation uh, breakout type patterns. Seasonal and cyclical analysis tells me in advance what the potential turn of a sector might be, right? Volume tells me if there is participation in an underlying move. And then we have other things like the commitment of traders, which is exclusive to futures. We have another exclusive indicator for equities only. It's called breadth advanced decline analysis. And then we have a methodology that we use and teach people for how to trail stops and for entries and breakouts, last conditional change. So the 12-step program, as I kind of call it, it's just these are techniques. There's a different tool to uncover different information. So if I'm looking for something to tell me, are we overbought, then I would probably think that a lot of stocks would be at resistance. And in order for me to get through and tell you and define what is resistance, you know, um, we also want to kind of take a look at 
whether a stock or the segment of the markets are, if they're all going up in, in tangent, or if they're a concerted concentration amount of stocks or sectors moving up. Now, look at this chart, and some of you might think that this is a little on the psychedelic side, but this, this is actually from a, a webinar we did back in May, and you can see where this is June and this was May, we did this here. Um, what the point that we do is we list all these segments of the market. This is the uh, oil and gas exploration, XOP, utilities, the XLE energy, material, and you can see all the alphabets in here that I use a lot of sectors and subsectors like the SOX, the semiconductor, the insurance, the KIE over here, XRT, which is the retail ETF, looking at the regional banks, the financials, the XCI, which XCI is the computer hardware technology sector ETF. And then again, many of you are probably, if you're trading stocks, you know about the IBB, the biotech. What's interesting about this is this is a percentage change. While all of these sectors are priced differently, this kind of gives me a gauge of what's happening in the market. This is the starting line that every fund manager looks at what he has to beat, the performance of the market, the beginning of the year. At the beginning of the year in January, only utilities were moving up. The um, little, I guess you want to call it pink color, watermelon color there, XLU, that's the utilities. Um, and in January, when everyone in the media was telling everyone to sell their stocks, you know, what we were seeing was a lot of the sectors actually were forming, as you can kind of read, and I'm showing you here, a lot of stocks as we bounced off in January, right, we made a, a bounce. When we came back in February, we were making, a lot of these sectors were making higher lows. We actually had more stocks uh, making a secondary higher low, and and what was interesting is that at that same point in time, we have a computer program that we've created using pivot points, and I'm going to flash it up right now. Now, don't freak out, but this is pretty advanced and it's pretty slick stuff. If you understand pivot points, I'm going to give you the crash course on pivot points. Pivot point analysis is based off a mathematical formula that entails taking the high, the low, the close of a given time frame divided by three. That value right there is the what we call the pivot or typical price and in my work I always label the pivot as a blue line okay now if the markets truly bullish we should probably make higher highs and higher lows so the person's pivot indicator is actually a filtered pivot point that gives us the defined resistance which I put resistance as red support green and the pivot blue. And as you can see, more times than not, this gives us a defined look-see at what the range and the trend direction of the market might be in a given time frame. And when we start to see like a change in valuation where the one time frame ends and a new time frame begins, and all of a sudden the pivot changes from making higher high to lower high and lower low, a lower high and a lower low. We start to get a, 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 an indication that the trend is going down. And so therefore, when we get a trend change and we start to see at the end of a time frame, this, is, this didn't happen before, this happens at the end of a time frame. So at the end of the month, and this is monthly pivots, if we get an idea that the market is changed from bearish to bullish, it's going to project a higher low and a higher red, which means we've just now gone from a uh, neutral stance to a bullish stance. A lot of people miss this on person's pivots. They just think it's an indicator that it's pivot points. Notice that you're seeing a switch up at based on the math formula that allows us to understand that there's a change in the market and with that change if we're bearish technically the picture has changed to bullish we may want to study the market a little closer 
So person's pivots is kind of an important segment of the market as an indicator that tells me, oh, by the way, if the market is bullish, maybe I should look for buy signals near support. Now, if you look back here in January, this is the NASDAQ futures, um, we were nearing support, nearing support. Um, what's really, really neat, and I'm going to minimize this real quick and expand this radar screen. What my work entailed and what we created was various time frames of pivot analysis. And as you can see, it tells me what the status is. What's the status? Let's go over here to equities. All right. So what we've done, folks, and this is since we are, and I'm sure everyone would agree with me, the markets are pretty advanced. We need advanced tools. Problem, markets are moving all over the place. People have different opinions, but I think we need to have an unequivocal formula or mathematical base that helps keep us on the right side of the market. And this is a tool that has done that. So what I wanted to point out to you is when I tell you about person's pivots, this is a very advanced system. But it's advanced in the sense that it's the same formula that I've personally used for over 35 years, number one. It's just that we've applied it a lot differently. And thanks to the computer, I can take a look at thousands of stocks, segments of the market in a split second. So as we come into June, what's ironic is that you will notice that the month of um, June, we have our support and we have our resistance. And right now, if you look at these are all the sector ETFs, that the ones that I follow closely. And under the, each sector ETF, I have the top stocks in that sector. So what I want to do is I want to find out how many of these sectors have just generated buy signals. That's pretty important. And how many are still in a bullish uh, environment? How far away, in just one quick second, how far away, if I draw a line over here, how far away to the predicted monthly support is the biotech? Right now, it's 7% away from its support. It's 7.5% or 7.3% away from its resistance. That's pretty cool. I know exactly where the market is. It's in the middle of its predicted monthly range. Um, that is powerful information. Now, how do we define if a market's overbought or oversold? That's, a, that's another great little question that I have an answer to. If you notice, it says pivot Q over here. Since a lot of markets trade on a quarterly basis, I introduced to the world that we've been using quarterly pivots for over three decades. And in this example, uh, or what this board tells me, if you notice here where it says resistance, and you look on down the, 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 the column right here, notice where it's red it's red, and then this one's gray, and then this one's blue. What does that mean? It simply means that this instrument, which is the KRE, which the KRE are regional banks, it's at its predicted quarterly pivot. Huh. Now, that's interesting. Follow me for a second. Notice out of the top sectors that we follow of the ETFs, notice that there's a lot of red and there's gray. If it's gray, it means it's beyond its predicted resistance. So it means that for the quarter, which ends in June, which we're in June, we have a lot of segments of the market that have already gone up to the respected resistance. Let me tell you something. Back in January and early February, it was the opposite. We had a lot of stocks and segments, and everyone was saying sell and they were all at their respected supports. What does that mean to me? It means we're technically starting to see segments of the market hit a longer term resistance. And my, my first inclination is sell, but I'm not going to sell unless I validate my theory that the market price is overbought. And some of the tools, if you go down here and we look at this column right here, it says resistance on a quarterly basis. Notice that everything is, I mean, there's a lot of red and a lot of gray. I mean, there's a lot of stuff here, a lot of red and a lot of gray. So on a higher degree time frame, we're finding, um, let's see, who's this guy? Let's see, Home Depot, just for the, I just wanted to find one that's, 
that shows red. So Home Depot has been at, and, and this is one that um, has been near uh, its monthly resistance. It's already come down. So here's the quarterly pivot resistance. And what's ironic is in this big rally that we've got going on, uh, Home Depot's having a hard time managing to trail with the rally. Um, there's a couple other little things that we could talk about, like the momentum of the the, the momentum starting to uh, visually lose its positive uh, trend. So we're starting to see more and more stocks that were strong start to weaken on this rally and are hitting near pivot resistance. So that in itself is another tool that we utilize. And part of what I wanted to share with you tonight is what do I do and how do I look for opportunities? And the first thing that I was uh, talking about is person's pivots to define a trend direction and determine support and resistance for most time frames, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly. So bullet point number three, I just showed you literally a, a very advanced, powerful, accurate program that does that in a snap of a finger for most segments of the market, whether it be stocks, futures, or Forex. So that's one way we try to put things together for myself and as well as my traders. Using this chart, this is all this is, is just a kind of a relative strength percentage chain to find out where the markets are at. I took the liberty of doing a little extra work rather than using an old presentation, folks, and I updated this one for you tonight just to get an idea of what things have changed. Um, OP has exceeded and has gone from about year to date negative 20% to over 24% positive. We have seen approximately a 44% move in XOP since the lows in February. You remember the lows when everyone said crude oil was going to 20, right? Um, and now we're way the heck up here. Well, what does this mean to me? Do I really buy into that the market is a, an absolute value? We have to buy it right now. Um, well, we were hoping to see a little more strength out of biotech. Um, and we were hoping to see a little bit more performance by this tier sector group. Uh, obviously, XRT, the financials, the healthcare XLV, some semis, the insurers, uh, or regional banks, excuse me. I was hoping to see a little bit more uh, emphasis or heavy lifting by those sectors of the market. Right now, the heavy lifting of the market has been energy, OIH, XLE, XOP, and ironically, note that utility stocks, XLU, XLU is almost it just actually at its high for the year. So you're, you're looking at your percent change or your leadership of what sectors are driving the market. This is something I think in this environment, every investor, if you're trading stocks, needs to look at doing. So therefore, you can kind of get a gauge of, in order to figure out where a market's going to go, where's the market come from? What's the leadership of the market? These are the kind of tools that you have access to institution at, 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 traders are using this style of analysis and these are the kind of tools as I pointed out the 12 point bullet uh, point that that we are in effect using as well. A couple weeks ago we did this um, analysis on biotech and I actually this is the I'm cheating because this was the slide from that that night and I said you know I've been using seasonal analysis for over 30 years the leader in the industry uh, by far, the guy who started it all was this company right here, Trade Navigator. Um, so many people through the decades have followed their um, leadership. These guys did cutting edge stuff 30, 27, 30 years ago. These were the guys that started it all. Everyone else has kind of copied them. Um, but what's kind of neat is that in looking at some of the seasonal tendencies of the market, You'll notice that in May, we tend to bottom out in a little biotech, and we get a little move into, uh, you know, it's choppy into July. Um, we get kind of a time frame in, in mid-May, and you know what? Biotechs did move up. There's a conference this week. It's choppy today, but boy, 
we had a tremendous amount of, of upside. Using seasonal analysis is important in my work. I mean, it's something I've been using for over 30 years. Um, but I wanted to bring to your attention, it's not just looking at the seasonal tendency. This is something I write. It's called my weekly thoughts and observation. This is an exact quote. I copy-paste it from May 16th. Um, we want to be looking at either look for a daily buy signal in IBB as well as the XBI. Also watch XBI for a close above 5270. That would have been a last conditional change. I actually put this on the chart. It's in our, our research report. We went in to say we've got um, it's trading at monthly support. Here's the green is monthly support. So what are we doing? We had, look at this analysis, how cool this is. Monthly person's pivots targeted a higher low and a higher high for the month of May. The market traded down to it, and all we were doing was looking for a trigger to go long against support in a seasonally strong period of time. We had a bit of a bullish convergence in the stochastics, and also the OBV indicator, something that I've taught thousands of traders to use over the last decade. It seems to be now catching on. No offense, I think famous TV guys are probably using it now. Uh, but long and short of it is, if it helps people, that's what it's about, to help people make better trade decisions. And I'm here to tell you, it's not just one indicator. You have to have a few dynamic indicators put together correctly. It's like taking, you know, um, Poxy glue. By itself, it does nothing, but mix it together, bang, you got an incredible bond. So seasonal analysis is one thing, but combining the two are another. Um, by the way, the XBI, uh, just this was a follow up that we did on a webinar in the XBI, um, if, if I may add. Here was actually the PPS. Now, we were using the Thinkorswim indicator, the Thinkorswim platform here. And you could clearly see, here's the monthly person's pivot indicator, right? There's the monthly support. Here's the OBV starting to move up. There was the trigger to go long. It actually broke out 5271. That was the long trigger to entry. And, um, you know, we did uh, scale out of that, and we put in a stop, and since then the market's gone up so very nice trade um, in fact if you'd like to see the results of where it is today XBI and what uh, transpired since then real simply put real nice example of how to put together a trading plan so from the time of the entry at 5271 and the next day's open um, and then, well, let's not take the exact high, but I'll just take the today's close. It's up 12%. Now, that's an ETF, right? The biotech ETF. A very nice trade all the way up, no doubt about it. And based on, if we go over here, you can clearly see there's the monthly support. A nice little launch. We've uh, actually put on a couple of other indicators that you can see, like your MACD and your stochastics, just for comparative reasons, okay? So there are ways that we can make money in this market. This simple concept of this high closed doji. By the way, here's the actual chart, the XOP, um, up almost from its high closed doji way back here in March, a weekly high closed doji. This has been in a higher degree time frame buy signal since March, friends. And it has done nothing but give a gift. And I think, but the market here, uh, I'm a little concerned. It's 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 getting a little tired. The XOP is getting a little tired. I think we might have a little bit more upside, but I'd be cautious. I, I think we, we're probably going to uh, regress to the means just a tad. This indicator right here, this is a special. It's not a MACD. This is a proprietary indicator. It's starting to show weakness on this run-up. Uh, this is a momentum, a separate momentum indicator. It too is starting to show divergence over a weekly time period. Now, if you're interested in trading crude oil and if you're interested in trading certain segments of the market, and I know this is a very dynamic 
uh, subject matter because I am now flat this sector. We are out of the sector. I actually dumped uh, XOP today. So uh, in our own trading community, uh, it was just a, a, a few indicators were giving us a warning sign of um, it's time to step back and when we'll reevaluate. And um, we, we, you know, hitting near the uh, targets of resistance A, B, the momentum indicator C, the volume indicator was telling us to exit the trade. This is the trade we just did this week. If you'll notice here, I wanted to discuss a, a couple things, the person's pivots, momentum indicators, but also this powerful pattern that I uh, disclosed to the world called the high closed doji. You'll notice if you're not familiar with candlestick analysis and you don't know what a doji is, a doji is a candle pattern that simply has a range and the market opens, but yet closes at or near its open. Now, at or near is a computerized algorithmic term. What is the close defined? Is it exact? Is it within a percentage amount? And I have a little bit of percentage amount that I give a little leeway between the open and close relationship. But a doji has no real body. You can clearly see a red candle. You can see a green candle. And if we define a candle as a doji, my indicators color code it as blue. But when we get that special close above the high of the doji, right? That's a doji. And this orange candle, all that means is it closed above the high of the doji. Can everyone see that? Here's the high of the doji. It closed above the high of the doji. So the rules state on my high close doji, you buy on the close or the next session open, and your risk goes underneath the low of the doji, so or the lowest low of the last four bars. So when the market gives a close above the high of the doji, you're entering the long, and your stop goes there. And now you're just looking to profit. So it's a matter of a um, if you get an amazing profit, like in back here in uh, early mid March, this is Columbia Sportswear C O L M. We got another buy this week already. Just between yesterday and today, it's up about four uh, percent. Not a bad little move. This is Las Vegas Sands. This was another trade. Not a big deal, but a high closed doji nonetheless, as you can see. And since the open yesterday, buying on the close, the next session open, Las Vegas Sand up 3%. Now, I want to go through and I want to show something to you, just so that you know, you know, I know you, many of you probably been to a few webinars. That could be a joke. Uh, don't laugh. But I think what's um, really interesting is this is a weekly thoughts and observation. And I want you to know I'm not really just cherry picking some of the trades. I want to show you something here. All right, so I'm going to go here, and you can see that this was last modified on uh, the 5th. It's all, I was a little late this weekend because I was at the Memorial Golf Tournament in Columbus, Ohio. Um, so, But I got the workout for, for Sunday night. We sent that out to our clients first thing. Um, here's what just the long and the short of it is, uh, stuff that we, we cover. But... Do you see the bullish HCD triggers? These were um, Kohl's, Nordstrom's, Columbia, Las Vegas Sands, and Exelon. Transports and automotive, these two had bearish low closed OGs. These are triggers. Um, also, by the way, Under Armour. Um, we're looking for a trigger to go long on Under Armour, and I'm taking a position on Under Armour rather than Nike. By the way, today, Under Armour triggered a buy signal. I thought I'd just share that with you because the work that I do is is um, uh, transparent, and and what's neat is uh, obviously it, it translates to the kind of trades that we do. Um, this was a comment back from May 16th. Uh, if you trade the equities like the Nasdaq, for example, or the Qs, uh, we were looking for either a buy signal near 42.30 or 103 and a half in the Qs or watching a daily close over that level right there in the queues and looking for a move to get back up to um, in the queues to 110, 111, coincidentally at the April 12th low, 20th lows. 
So looking at seasonal analysis, we did a little bit of commitment, a trader's report revealing that the speculators were short. This is powerful information. I just wanted to share with you the type of analytics that we put together that helps us to navigate a lot of these markets. Now, I'm ripping through this pretty quickly. I hope you guys are following because it's very dynamic information. And, and you know what? It's been working this year <laughs> and last year and the year before. This was something that I put out back in April, or excuse me, May 23rd's issue. How many of you folks remember back last year that the world was making a big deal about high yield growth, the HYG, right? The HYG, the High Yield Corporate Debt ETF, HYG, it was in a death spiral, right? So HYG is in the candlestick and I took the liberty to overlay the S&P in a line chart, which is black. So why is this interesting? Well, I put this out because I was telling my um, clients that we've been in a buy. We actually had a high closed doji. You can see it right there in HYG, an increase in volume. And I don't think anyone's really talked about the HYG. And what, while many people were talking about a head and shoulders top in the market, I was talking about HYG is accelerating to the upside. And you can see the correlation between it's not tick for tick, but, you know, the market goes down and it goes up and, you know, this went down, but that went up. I mean, but the overall trend, you know, you could see the overall trend of the market. It seems that there is that strong correlation to the market. HYG went uh, down and then finally the S&Ps go down at that point in time, right? And HYG starts to lead the way up and then the S&Ps go up. So what we were looking at was the, um, you know, like I said, not a 100% correlation, but uh, based on the indicators, um, it looks like this market wants to reach the quarterly pivot at 85.75 in the HYG. So this is just two weeks ago. It did two things for us. It said, hey guys, um, I believe that the S&Ps um, are going to move up because there's a strong correlation and the HIG, the HYG has a, uh, uh, a strong shot of hitting the resistance. And we'll just share with you right now uh, near that 85 number. So this is the uh, high yield growth. While we didn't get to the 85 level yet, we did get a little breakout here um, up near 84 and change. So not bad shooting and not bad analysis to feed off of uh, a market that I think a lot of, uh, no one's really talked about. Um, in fact, HYG, and I wanted to share this, is just some of these bullish high close dojis. This is from the week of May 23rd. Uh, Seagate Technologies, STX, who in their right mind, Seagate Technology, uh, you know, it, it got pummeled. If you're a stock trader, you know this stock got pummeled, right? Let's take a look at what defined pummel, um, pummeled, defined pummeled. Let's take a look. Um, this, in my books, is pummeled. But nonetheless, look what we have. Pivot support and then the high closed OG. Since the high closed OG, which we reported, this market has seen a nice recovery by about 23% since May 23rd. Um, we had, of course, the XBI up 9%. AIG, AIG, now it's unchanged, quite frankly. Um, a brokerage, E-Trade, still it, it, it backed off its highs. I'm just going as of today's close. It's up since the time the HCD trigger was given. If you didn't get out, you're still up less than a percent. And then Williams and Company up 9.8 percent. That's as of today's close. So it is important to be able to do what? What do you think might be important if 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 you somehow could get a scan and say, show me weekly high close dojis. See this right here? Weekly high close dojis. Show me stuff that gives me high close dojis. 
what this actually does is this shares with me um, what sectors are generating. So basic materials, capital goods, consumer, and again, energy. There was a few energy names that many of you are probably familiar with. Valero, uh, you, you got Phillips 66 and a little upside there. But in the financial arena and um, all the way down in some of the healthcare, the service sector, this is for this particular week. And you can see the scans ran at 6-4 at 8 o'clock at night or 8 o'clock in the morning, excuse me. Um, mobile, mobile eye um, had some follow through. Juniper Networks, some follow through. Um, who's this? Here we go. Here's another one. Uh, uh, Verifone System. So these are the high closed dojis that you're seeing uh, live and the effectiveness. When the market generates that trigger, you have a shot. Now, it's not the greatest trade in the world. I get it. But from 27.14 up to 28, it's a, you know, a buck move on a $20 stock. Uh, not too bad. We also, um, if we go up to the symbol here, and I change this, I just wanted to go in and, and note, we had uh, this one small company called Nordstrom's, which has gotten its proverbial butt kick. You got to admit, if you don't know what a proverbial butt kicking is, a stock that's trading at the end of March at 60 and trades down to around the 30 uh, upper 30 level uh, in, in just about less than 10 weeks, that's a proverbial butt kicking. Okay, just so I just want you to know when you look in the dictionary under proverbial butt kick, that's the chart right there you stare at. Okay, ugly. But what's interesting is the momentum, the volume, we started to lose that. And, and we got that magical little combination, the high close doji right there. That's how that hit our list this week. So it was in that sector of the market. You remember just a few moments ago, I mentioned Under Armour. Under Armour, I think we have a weekly doji which has not triggered yet. That's the doji. So it hasn't given a high close doji for the week. But what I was looking for this, this particular week, since the stock is trading, see that green line, monthly support? I was looking for it to give either a PPS buy or a daily high close doji, and we actually did uh, trigger that today. So we have a defined risk situation, uh, by the way, in Under Armour, and we have a bullish momentum uh, indicator flashing both in volume as well as momentum. So this could be, you know, a nice little short-term play. We'll see um, as we go into uh, the next week or so. Uh, so quite frankly, running scans is a very powerful tool for people in this day and age if you know what to look for. Um, I wanted to give you guys a chance to know who the heck I am and then also to offer you guys what I do. I put together what's called the weekly thoughts and observations. Um, I think I've just sort of shared this particular week and I'll do it again. This is this week's um, thoughts. Uh, I put together a few things. Last week, uh, one of the trades that we put out was a uh, as we were looking for gold, and I just wanted to follow up. Uh, we were looking for gold to hold between the 0696 handle. We hit 01, and we implemented and told people to look at GLD a 114 112 um, bull put spread. That that would be a credit spread. Looking for the market to kind of just sit here. Um, I'm still thinking that gold, by the way, that's on balance volume, and that is the volume histogram. Um, two things happen on light volume. Markets can go up sharply on light volume, um, and unless volume attracts more traders, prices can stall and come right back down just as fast. So I am not a buyer of gold here. Um, and that's what we were um, talking about a, last week. Gold prices consolidate, blah, 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 la, la, la. So great trade ideas uh, that we put out. And more importantly, I didn't have a chance to go through this, but I'm going to share this chart with you. This is the, um, in fact, let me just go over here to TradeStation real quick, and I'm going to go and show you something that if you're not familiar with breadth analysis or advanced decline, this is kind of cool stuff. 
This is the advanced decline cumulative ratio, but this is the advanced decline on the Dow, the advanced decline on the NASDAQ 100. This is one on the composite. This is on the Russell, and this is the S&Ps. Why in the heck would I look at the advanced versus declining issues on different stock sectors? And the answer is real simple, because we are in a segmented segmented, segmented market environment, meaning there are uh, financials, um, nothing, there are uh, energy, there's biotech, and not all of these indexes uh, are weighted towards um, all of these sectors. Like, for example, the Qs are more weighted towards what? Technology and biotech. Uh, the Russell is small cap growth. Dow is... Uh, Dividend yielding blue chips, the S&P has a broad base factor with financials and, uh, and of course, healthcare. And this guy over here that everyone seems to like to watch, the breadth analysis, like the, the, the tick or the arms index, it's actually over 60% of the stocks contained in the NYSE are interest rate sensitive stocks, REITs, bond funds, preferred stocks, and about one-fifth of the stocks contained in the NYSE. Friends, they're foreign companies now. So I'm here to tell you, if you follow like something called the McClellan Oscillator, it's, it's based off of the price action in the NYSE. This is the state of the markets that we are in, and every different segment of the market affects a different index. And you can clearly see something uh, by taking a look at this analysis, and this is what we uh, put together for our traders. S&Ps did break out. It did break out with a good accumulation of the AD lines and an uptick in volume. But note that the NASDAQ did not. The volume is lacking. The breadth broke out. You'll notice the Dow Jones did not break out. We just broke out a bit here. We barely broke out here on the NASDAQ composite. We did break out on the Russell, but we didn't break out with the breadth participation. So to me, this is saying that while we did get a good run, we're probably going to experience a day or two consolidation here, and then we will watch to see if the consolidation comes on a bigger loss on breadth or if everything maintains. And over the next couple of days, we'll have a clearer picture whether this rally is here to stay and has legs to continue up or whether or not we're going to maybe have one more dip back down to test their, uh, these, this, the pivot areas and, again, the moving averages. So, it's, it's, again, it's the condition. I always teach this to people. I look for this myself. It's not the rally. It's not the price indicators like a stochastics and a MACD. It's the condition and the health and the breadth of the market. How did it get here? When they say it's a broad-based rally, this is the kind of analysis that professional traders are using. And I hate to say that this might be too complicated, but you know what? It's really easy to learn. It's really easy to apply. It's just a matter of a little checklist. And I'm here to share with you guys the work that I do. And that we put a lot of, a lot of work in here. If we get lucky. The harder we work, the luckier we get, I'm here to tell you. I put together this weekly analysis, and I email it out every Sunday. I try to get it on Saturdays. It includes our sector ETFs, what kind of stuff we're looking for. Um, you know, we put this together June 1st, just so that you know. I'm going to share this with you as well. This is pretty powerful. When did this come out? On May 31st. So if you look at your calendars, you're going to say, this guy's crazy. May 31st. This guy's you know, I, I actually work on weekends, right? Because this is this is something that I do for me. This is this is something that I do for my work. Um, so before the end of the month, I not only work on weekends, but I also did this uh, after Memorial Day. What did this actually signify? Weekly high close dojis. Look at this XOP, FXI, the China ETF, FXI. So this was some pretty powerful information that we put together for traders. I don't know if you look at the FXI, but I'm going to share that with you real quick. 
because that's another little indicator as well. China, many people might not be talking about a couple things. China, um, which by the way dragged our markets down uh, at the end of last year, they've been kind of helping to drag the markets up. And uh, by the way, you'll notice here the little high closed doji, and you'll notice that it's it exited the profit objective. The trade got in, the trade got out, it hit the objective. Um, the fact that the China ETF hit its objective also gives me the inclination to feel that the overall markets here in the U.S., if China has a little bit of a pullback, we too may see a pullback in the market so that this little last rally might be slightly overstretched, as I'm pointing out to you. But that was the results of the uh, weekly high close doji. And, and what's ironic is it had a, a, a kind of a nice little scan, a pickup of a daily high close doji at monthly support. Gee, who would have thought run a scan of buy signals near pivot monthly support? Something we put together a long time ago, guys. It is important and it works and it's efficient. So I'm here to offer you guys, if you're interested, a very dynamic opportunity for $49 a month, four times a week. You can get my weekly thoughts and observations. Try for one month. I, I'm probably pretty sure it'll pay for itself. And not only that, I bet you'll learn something too. I didn't even get into the seasonal commodity spreads. Not, not commodity seasonality, but actually I put together every month in this report, by the way, what exact, um, of course, some very uh, great learning lessons of technical points of interest. But I also put together um, high probability, which includes 80% win over 25 years of back test studies of specific commodity spreads every month. And these are the commodity spreads, the dates that you enter and exit, the results are, uh, again, that criteria is over 80% success over the last 25 years. So you won't find any more pork belly trades because they delisted pork bellies. But, you know, um, if they did have them, we'd have them. Whatever the high probability is for that time, uh, that's the trades that we put out for our clients. Whether you like to trade it or not, it's in there, seasonal commodity spread trades. We also put together and review every Monday morning a uh, what we call planning and scanning, and we record that. So if you can't make it Monday morning, we record it and we post it. We send you an alert saying, hey, if you got time to watch this, it's about a 30 to 45 minute uh, pre-market session that we do that covers this newsletter. It says, hey, here's what we're doing. By the way, if you didn't understand it, this is a great way of taking advantage of learning more about John Person and the style of work that I've just put forth with you guys. If you just want to learn on yourself, I've got a great opportunity for you here. This stock trading simplified for $197. I'm telling you right now, this is an incredible value. It is a very powerful course. It goes A to Z, what person's pivots are, the high closed doji, the rules of engagement, what's the waiting, what's the holding period, where the entry, the stop, and your profit objective targets are. It really is a dynamic um, course that we put together that is uh, even includes listing of all the, the majority of the major ETF and inverse ETFs. If you want to try both, kind of get a learning of what the, the lingo is and uh, get a, a learning curve, get the course, try a month of this. You can get both for, you know, a few ticks in the S&P, $237. That is a dynamic offer. And I would have to say that if you guys are looking to learn a little bit better, if you're looking to get some very substantial, um, I wouldn't say education, but real techniques on entries and exits ahead of the crowd. It's kind of funny. A lot of the stuff, and, and the majority of the time, by the time I'm getting out of stuff, it's just getting on the news and being populated. Um, and, and I think that's kind of the way we have to be. For my for my audience and for my traders, what one thing, and I've written about this in many weekly thoughts and observations, is that this year when we seem to get a 5, a 10, and close to 20% move in equity or an ETF, you got to e hit the exit button. You know, get out of half and then, you know, trail, trail 
um, your stops because this is not a market environment where we're seeing stocks go from 10 to 20, 10 to 40, you know, 40 to 80. It's not a double stock. It's not the, the late 90s anymore. Um, and and I, I think there's just that wall of worry that has created, been created thanks to the Federal Reserve and global um, economic contraction, negative uh, reversion on, on interest rates. Um, and, and of course, everyone's worried about what's happening with Brexit, the, the, the uh, Britain exit vote that's coming up on June 23rd. Um, I can tell you this. I like to trade what I see, not what I hear. Um, and it, the technical tools that I developed, number one, popularized, number two, and trade with, number three, has been extremely instrumental in helping us to identify, listen to this key word, has helped us to identify these major shifts, something that I have been like pointing out to, to people. The market seems to be like a swarm of locusts. They go from one farm, then they go over to another, they suck it dry, they go to another, they suck it dry, they go to another, they suck it dry. They go from like utilities, then they go over to semis, then they go to biotech, they jump over to energy, then they're back into utilities, they're back over here. And meanwhile, most people are just getting a little bit chopped alive. Um, the scans that we use and the condition under those scans have been instrumental. Over a month ago, we told people that the semi sector, as I shared with you on that, that tweet, I said X, um, the um, XCI, IBB, the semiconductors, the SMH, that's the semiconductors, that software, computer software sector, should do well. One of my students today just reminded me, we had a, a, a stock we were uh, talking about in the trading room called, and you're going to, you're going to, this is, this is a killer. I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, <laughs> this was uh, a, a very, this is today, all right? I know this is kind of a killer. A high closed doji at support. It just kept giving another high closed doji at pivot support. It kept giving another high closed doji, and the da darn thing just kept going. Uh, F5 networks. Um, so F5 networks. It was in a PPS buy mode on an increase of volume, and then today it just absolutely launched and continued. Um, what's really cool about this is. I didn't even talk about this tonight, and we ran out of time. But you see these white lines? Those are my last conditional change. This is the, the levels that we, as the market starts to move up, you, you use to scale out against resistance and place stops underneath those lows. That's the John Person famous stop method, the trailing stop method. You know, I don't think anyone in their right, anyone, nobody could predict this move was coming. All we could do is predict there was a buy signal and how you trade it, and what tools do you have to give you the confidence to maybe hold the position a little bit longer. So the fact that, that we do have a, uh, just to give it a little bit of examination, a strong surge in momentum, a very strong move with the um, volume indicator, and then the momentum indicator was still showing positive. Now this is a, uh, an indicator, it's not MACD, it's proprietary indicator acts something like a MACD, but it's based off of what's up here, these pivots. This trading system is something that I put together and I filter out these stocks. And guess what? All of that gets put together each and every week in the research contained in the weekly thoughts. So if you're looking to try something new, um, you know what? Right there, $49. And if you want to try to put the two together, I really tell you, it's a fabulous offer of 237. Here's how you can find that, and you can read a lot more about it. Just go to our website, it's personsplanet.com, and I'll put the link into the room, and you can see it right here. All right, if you're interested in learning a little bit more and getting this, it's dynamic. So, again, it's not a day trade analysis right? Um, it's not, I guess a day trade, it could be considered a day trade. If you get in on Monday morning and the stock jumps up 5-10% by Monday afternoon, it could, could be considered a day trade. But 
more importantly, this is like a, a swing trade and, and possibly as much as a, a position trade lasting eight to 10 weeks, okay? So on, on a lot of the different trades. If you're in an option trader, we talk about, like I pointed out with GLD, um, or a trade we did with Home Depot. We actually did credit call spreads in Home Depot. Uh, we sold uh, the July uh, two weeks ago when the stock traded up to um, around 135. We did the 135, 140 um, credit call spreads collected $2.20. Home Depot's down since, so this, the trade's done well. Um, so we try to put out, based on the technicals, the condition of the market, option strategies and give direction and holding period for our clients. That's that's the basis of the weekly uh, planning and scanning. Um, and with that said, you can certainly learn more about how to utilize the stock trading simplify and you can click there and you can order if you want whichever one you want to sign up. In addition to that, for those that have thinkorswim, if you get this tonight and you do have a thinkorswim account, I want to let you have special video how to set up my PPS and person's pivots, how to select the scans using thinkorswim, right? And how to spot sector-wide buying opportunities using the TOS scan features. And then I like to include, which I've done, the do's and don'ts utilizing other indicators. In other words, some people put up multiple indicators not knowing they, they're actually giving two of the same bit of information, like specific moving averages in a maybe a, a MACD or perhaps CCI. And, and some of those indicators, while they're not confirming, uh, they're just duplicating the, the results. So I like to help people out and, and let them know, hey, by the way, these are the indicators you kind of want to avoid if you're using multiple indicators. That will all come together for those um, that are interested in, in the bonus package tonight. So you'll have access to that video. So I wanted to say if, if you guys, um, if, you, if you had at least an, an intriguing time tonight knowing this is an awful lot of information, you know, it really isn't. It's just a matter of using a little bit of Logic, common sense. Think about it. Logical, common sense. Is the breadth strong? Are all sectors going up? Or is it only a few sectors leading the market? And what if the few sectors leading the market start to downturn in the next couple days, right? What if those really strong sectors in energy start going down? And what if the bank sector starts to get down? And what if biotech runs out of steam? What would the overall markets do then It'd probably be a little scramble for the front door or the back door whichever case you want to look at it so I think these are the kind of tools that it helps us to uncover is the rally on strong volume is the is the rally on good breadth is are all the markets segments participating in this rally that's the analysis that we help people understand when it relates to trading these equity markets and what segments of the equity markets are doing well and not. As far as the commitment of traders report, you know, that's just, to me, one of the most dynamic insider trading tools that I teach people, but I put a different twist on it. Um, and that's something we discuss in that stock trading course for stock traders. So if you're trading stocks, the S&P 500, there's a nice little segment in there that teaches you which of the commitment of traders to follow because there are actually several different variations of commitment of traders so um, I think that's something that's kind of important to discuss I hope you got something out of tonight's uh, session um, you know what we went over just as a quick review is to elaborate that there are ways that we could utilize the computer to do the heavy lifting for us to run scans number one we also identify the fact that um, now you know that job person is a big component uh, uh, of, of following seasonal analysis and has been for over 35 years of the markets. I mean, after all, when, when you start trading down in, in, in commodities, if you don't know that the seasonal lows are in, at, at, in uh, the spring for planting and um, the harvest uh, lows or by midsummer, 
the, the corn should be knee high by the 4th of July. And then we, we generally got three ways to, to kill a crop. What are those? Uh, wet spring, drought, and early frost. So those are your big things that you, you know, you got to know. And that seasonal analysis, that supply and demand, very important. Best time to buy crude oil? Right about when everyone says it's going to 20. For decades, the best time to buy, on average, crude oil is around the first week of February, by the way. So knowing that and having that in the back of my mind, don't you think it makes sense? By the way, run scans. When's the worst time to buy crude oil? When do you guys think is the worst time to buy crude oil? Well, if there are no hurricanes or threats of storms in the Gulf, the worst time to buy crude oil and energy stocks is around September, by the way. So we're going to have an interesting summer. We're going to have fantastic markets one way or another. We can always find a market because there's a continual difference between supply and demand functions in the market. If it isn't the currencies, it's the you know weighted with the dollar. It's going to be, of course, um, looking at the ag complex. If it's not the ag complex, it's going to be the metals. If it's not the metals, it's going to be medical. If it's not medical, it's going to be some stock sector. It's up to us to figure out how to teach you to get you to learn how to follow and watch this so that you can make better educated trading decisions. I thank you for your time tonight. I hope you got something valuable out of this. This is dynamic trading education at a an incredible value. So I hope you take advantage of it, and I look forward to helping you trade better, number one. And number two, come under my wing as a trader. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening.